Can you say your name for the camera, please? My name is Lindsay Curry. And, uh, well, um, how, how did you come along to the event today, then? Um, uh, it was part of an Event Bright um, series on human rights. I'm very interested in human rights and um, very interested in disabled persons' human rights. So it was just a fit for me. Um, so I decided to sign up and come along. What do you feel about what you've learned today? Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, it's really good to know that there are people really working hard, groups working hard, advocating for the rights of disabled people. Um, I'm the mother of a profoundly disabled boy, so this indirectly affects me. I feel like I'm disabled by association, and it's something that's not usually spoken about. Um, because my son has PMLD, um, every part of his life is, is affected by disability and uh, therefore every part of my life is affected by his disability. Dis disability being the social model of disability, um, not actually the medical, medical model, it's more about the structural barriers uh, that, that we are facing. My son and himself, he's not disabled. The social model was something that was during the civil rights movement and the movement of rights of people. Um, it was a group of disabled men, actually, um, the UPIS, uh, who advocated for the rights. What they were basically saying was, well, uh, my understanding of it is that um, there was people who had been disabled during um, service, um, in America and uh, had, had come back from active service and realised that you know they couldn't access uh, services the way they used to be able to. Uh, I, I know that there was a motorcycle group I mean they couldn't access their motorcycle groups, they had to adapt their motorcycles and they wanted to move away from this medicalised model of what disability was where the doctor describes what's wrong with you and started to look towards what's wrong with society that makes them disabled because actually it was only structure that was stopping them from accessing a full and, and happy life. They could do everything they wanted to as long as there were some modifications to uh, the equipment that they used and so we started to move towards a more social model and uh, understanding that disability is something that comes along with society, people are not disabled, people are able absolutely in everything that they can do. There may be some limitations in society as to what they can do, but people are able, intrinsically people are able to do whatever they can do. They're disabled when society's parameters stop them from accessing you know, maybe services or swimming or leisure activities, transport, housing, cars, you know, the list goes on. I don't believe that the social model is alive and well. I believe that we're trying. Well, when I say we, I believe that society is trying to be more inclusive. But structurally, I mean, the, the first problem for anyone who has a profound disability is the, the accessible toilets, um, which is classed as changing places. Um, people who are disabled need more than a box to be able to use the toilet. Um, having a small box and putting a toilet in it and a handrail does not equate to an accessible toilet. My son, for example, would need a hoist. He would need a, a flat bed. I would need to have the room for both myself and him to get into it. My experience has been that my son has had to lie on the floor of urine stained uh, floor um, and have his pads changed or I've had to leave his I've had to leave his wheelchair outside in the door kind of a jar. I've had to put my jacket down on the floor and let my son lie on my jacket which I've then got to wear with someone else's urine and footprints on it um, in order just to change my son so that we can have a day out and that's using me as the voice, that's using me as the person that's doing all of the manual handling, all of the manual moving. Um, and the time that it takes uh, uh, that's just sheer determination to make sure that my son can access a leisure life a social life 
because if I wasn't able to do that, he just wouldn't be able to go out at all. So that to me isn't an accessible society. Well, the right to the right to play, yeah. the right to you know the right to access. Uh, my son can't have the right to play if he cannot access. A, 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 so I took my son skiing. Um, took him up to the top of the Cairngorm Mountains and had to change him in the back of my car. So we were driving. Uh, we, we left a quite accessible hotel. Um, we were driving for probably an hour and a half. He needed to be changed before he went on the mountain. Um, and I had to change him in the back of my car and it was snowing um, and it was very, very uncomfortable. Um, so to me, when you can, when we've managed to get children skiing down a mountain with the dis disabilities that he's got, the difficulties, the impairments, whatever you want to say, if we can get him down that mountain but can't get a toilet on the way to the mountain, then that impinges on his right to play. Now that's a basic human right for a child that's enshrined within the Children's Act that they have the right to play. You know, if we're talking about inclusion, then my son is absolutely excluded. Not because, because once he's on the mountain, he's surrounded by skiers and everyone's talking and that's not the problem. The problem is there's no toilet on the way and if it's not for, um, if it's not for the determination of people to just actually do this, he wouldn't have been on the mountain that day. He was on the mountain for the first day of skiing, which was incredible and such an achievement for him. And he enjoyed it so much. And something as small as a toilet could have stopped him from accessing that. Yeah. So, it's very frightening. Very frightening. Um, when I think about the cuts that have been made just now to disability benefits. Um, so I am a mum. And I can't work. And the reason I can't work is because my son requires 24 hour care. The bill to look after my son, 24 hours at 2 to 1 care, would be exorbitant. So I am at home and I look after my son, along with some support. Um, but what that means for me is I can't get a mortgage. So I don't have the right to a home. I, don't, I can't get a mortgage because I can't work. So then I've got to rely on social housing, which is absolutely inappropriate. At this moment in time, I live four up in a flat that the lift has broken down on numerous occasions. I've had to ask the fire service to lift my profoundly disabled son up in his wheelchair because I can't risk his health and safety. It's a risk to his life if I drop him whilst walking down the stairs. My son also suffers from... Um, refractory epilepsy so he has seizures that are uncontrollable and if he has a seizure while I'm trying to carry him four flights down a set of stairs I could drop him and kill him. That There are just uh, it would be too much to even start to try and unpick how these services and any cuts to these services will impact on my son and my life and I really feel that I will end up disabled by the government's cuts because if I can't get the support, if I can't get the support to lift him, to change him, to, to do all of the things, his basic human rights, then uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to end up hurting my back very severely and then I'm going to end up disabled physically. I'm already disabled by society, I'm already disabled by act I can't access mortgage, can't access a job. You know, I have the right to life, I have the right to work. I'm an educated person and I can't do anything with that because the support is not there to allow me. Because the welfare uh, cuts have affected uh, how many hours of, and it's always talked about in terms of hours, how many hours of service I'm entitled to and that, you know, it's not a babysitting service, absolutely, but if I could go out and work, I wouldn't be relying on the government to provide me with this care. I would be able to do this, I would be able to get a mortgage, which would then, I would be able to, you know, make the house accessible for my son. He would be able to play because he would have access to a garden. As it is, he's like four up in a block of flats, and if the lift breaks down, he's not getting out. So that affects every part of his life again.
I think that as uh, I think this will just naturally occur within society because I think as um, ethics allow for children to survive who would not have survived before um, so we're going to see and I, I truly believe that people are only interested in things when it comes to their, to their own back door we can nod and say yeah we're interested oh yeah yeah, very interested but when it actually affects people then they become very interested and uh, I believe that as society sort of just develops more and more children will be born with very profound disabilities and uh, different spectrums of disabilities or impairments um, and then people will have to modify their attitudes and their behaviour. People don't think, and it's not, but they just don't think, why would you think? Because it doesn't affect you. So to park on a, on a road, uh, on the pavement where you know there's a dip in the kerb, you're not thinking about someone's going to need to access that in a wheelchair. They don't think because they're not in a wheelchair. And usually, what happens is whenever anybody who is not physically impaired takes my son out, they're exasperated by the end of it, and they say things along the lines of, "I don't know how you manage." And it's like, well, actually, <laughs> I've got to manage. What do I do? What do I do? And that's tenacity. And sometimes tenacity can be very, very tiring, and very, very stressful. And that in itself, with carers, leads to mental health issues. The impact is huge. The impact is huge. It's too much to even start to try and unpick in one conversation. People, aging population, people are starting to realise with you know the aging population, their parents and how hard it is to get about in a chair and you know how inaccessible things are. Um, that's for that's for people that are older who have accessed, you know, all their life they've been able to maybe access uh, areas, shops and you know, holidays, etc. I'm starting from this has been thirteen years now that you know I've been doing this stuff since my boy was a tiny wee boy, wee baby to now he's a 13 year old boy and he's a big boy and going through every part of that so walking to a shop and having to immediately turn about and go out again because I haven't got the, I haven't got the uh, strength to have another conversation with the people about moving you know, could you move these rails so that we can have access here could you actually just do as you are obliged by law to do um, because it's exhausting, you spend, and they, you can become very angry and bitter. So as people start to experience that, because it will affect more and more people, people will become exasperated, and I believe that there's power in a collective. Um, and more arenas like this, more forums where there is a mixture of people who are physically disabled, um, I feel emotionally disabled at times, and just being able to spend time with people who are in the same boat or who are experiencing that, um, that's a forum and that's a forum for change. That stuff will change. It starts from you know starts from trying to get out of the house for some people. Just getting out of the house to trying to access education, to trying to access a job, to trying to access a social life. To tr these are all enshrined within the Human Rights Act and every single one of them. Uh, applies to my son and every single one of them is a battle that I take on myself to do to make sure because I know he's entitled to because I see him as a human <laughs> my boy's a human boy he's, a, he's entitled to absolutely everything that everybody else is entitled to unfortunately government systems don't see it that way and it's a tick box if you're ticking the box then it looks as though we're doing something but when you actually start to look at what's being done, I actually see a regression in society. I see a move towards group homes and cuts to benefits. I see us going backwards. So all of the gains that we've made in terms of human rights are slowly being stripped away. And they're being done underhandedly so that people don't really see what's going on. It's a little bit at a time, slowly said, oh, that costs so much, it might actually be more beneficial if we put you in a group home. Maybe we spent all, these time, all this time getting people out of group homes and the atrocities that went on and uh, 
we're starting to move backwards. So I think more than more now than ever, we need as much support as possible to make sure that this this can't happen. My son can't speak for himself. My son can't speak for himself, and if I end up in a situation where I'm so exhausted I can no longer speak up for him, I hope and pray that there's somebody here to speak up for us. That's it.